just uh, to begin with, I would like to thank uh, Pete and all at uh, Imagine Belfast for being very innovative and switching this all to online. Um, like many people, I'm now uh, confined to the house due to uh, family circumstances. So it's a really fantastic way of um, just getting out what the great program that Imagine had put together and, and getting it out there online. Uh, my research, this area of research is on the bicycle and protest in Ireland. Um, it is kind of um, a, a passion uh, of mine. Um, and I just wanted to show how the bicycle featured in, in a number of eras in Ireland's history from the late 19th century right through to the present day. Um, as I say, from the late 19th century, this humble machine, the bicycle, played a minor yet significant role in Irish history. In terms of international impact, the bicycle has been an integral part of protest and cultural change in a number of countries. And I'll give a couple of examples of that um, towards the end. It's been a, a tool which has helped shape uh, modern Ireland during turbulent periods of political and social upheaval. And from these times of revolution, right through to relatively peaceful times as a tool of cultural nationalism and a vehicle of, of um, to promote indigenous language rights, which I find very interesting. Uh, this means the bicycle is inextricably linked to a number of periods in Ireland's uh, political history. Sorry, sorry. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear a beeping sound? No, actually, no. That's okay. I, it just must be on this end. It's um, it's a very old computer, it? but it's not. What's that? Is it a truck reversing or something, is it? Sorry? Is it a truck reversing or something? No, no, no. It's actually on the computer. Um, oh. But if, uh, as long as it's not here, can you just, do you want me to start again? Uh, if or you just start just, from this, the, the beginning of the last sentence, that would be no problem. Okay. Um, so uh, the bicycle has been a tool which has shaped many aspects of modern Irish history during its often political and turbulent social history. Uh, from times of revolution through times, peace, more peaceful times as a tool of uh, cultural nationalism. And interestingly for me, as a vehicle for calling the attention to indigenous language rights on the island, the bicycle is inextricably linked to many uh, periods in Ireland's history in the last century and, and a bit. So what is really interesting to me in this is that the bicycle is a tool of protest, but it also allows the historian to look at what is termed history from below, uh, and that's in grassroots movements right throughout the island. Uh, and that, as I say, that span goes from the late 19th century right through to the present day. Um, to give a bit of background on the bicycle in Ireland, um, when the bicycle craze came in from the 1860s onwards, it was a fashionable pursuit for the upper middle classes and the well-to-do, and was very much tied into Victorian sensibilities and uh, ideals around masculinity and athleticism. And this led to a number of cycling clubs springing up right across the, the island um, in this period. But from the 1880s onwards, you had some innovations that um, completely changed this, uh, this pursuit of cycling. Uh, in the 1880s, uh, you had people like John Dunlop and John Camp Stanley who revolutionized the bicycle, making it more safer and easier to travel over terrain. And this made previous incarnations of the cycle, uh, the bicycle, such as the penny farthing with its large front wheel, it made that obsolete. If you think about what Ireland's roads were probably like, especially in rural areas, that wasn't a very good um, method of transportation for, uh, on that type of terrain. Uh, then when the 1880s, or sorry, the 1890s comes along, you have massive international competition and more innovation, which drives the prices down, thus making it more accessible to people, uh, much more people. Uh, 
and this uh, paves the way for something of a social revolution. Cyl uh, cycling gained much popularity across Ireland to the point that it completely changed how vast waves of the, of the population engaged in recreational activity, and in particular, how they engaged with transport. If you think about a distance in Ireland pre-cycling, uh, to walk that would have taken the best part of a day. Now you're looking at being able to travel that distance in per perhaps an hour or more. And that had a huge impact on life, especially in rural areas of Ireland. There's, and now that um, more people were able to avail of the, the, the bicycle, it meant that, of course, more people could engage in leisure pursuits, but it meant that more people had access to an instrument that could soon draw attention to a, a variety of social causes. Uh, and it wasn't long after the wider introduction that it was used as a, uh, a vehicle for social change. A number of historians have looked at this uh, social historians in recent years and have argued that the bicycle has many functions, an instrument of communication. Crucially, it's been used as a, a, a source of identity, a vehicle for pleasure and tools for technological, cultural and political critique. And as they were more available in numerous countries, uh, bicycles were becoming international tools for change and that's very important. Perhaps the first uh, mass protest using bicycles took place in San Francisco in 1896, in the summer of 1896. Uh, and a mass of cyclists protesting through the area drew in tens of thousands, up to 100,000 people or more to the, this protest um, to highlight what were now dangers to cyclists now since the introduction of the automobile. And that such an ordinary um, transportation machine as a bicycle was able to draw attention to a variety of issues, as I say, has gained a lot of attention in recent years. The bicycle's dual role as a, an instrument of social agitation and ordinary use is summed up succinctly by historian Dave Horton. And Dave Horton states that the, the bicycle is symbolic. It's an iconic object of political dis discourse and practical an object of everyday use and one which lends a distinctive form to the lives of political activists. So it, it is this um, dual purpose of a political tool, but also um, this instrument of exercise and social, um, a, a, a social tool that brings these together and makes it attractive for a lot of different people. But what connects all these movements right around the world is that they're mainly grassroots movements. In Britain, uh, the first the rise in popularity of the bicycle has, was seen as a catalyst for many social reforms, including uh, women's suffrage. And it's argued that suffrage, suffragists were able to start the process of personal independence through the bicycle. And that had profound implications for women in general in society. But if you look at it in an Irish context, especially in the revolutionary period, you had many people um, who were suffragists and who joined organizations like Kumnaman, who used the bicycle during the Irish Revolutionary Period to great, um, to great effect. And I'll talk a wee bit about, about that there uh, shortly. But when we talk about a social revolution with the bicycle, which was taking place in Ireland in the 1890s, what is important as well is that there was a social revolution, or a cultural revolution as well going on. Uh, with regards to the language, the literature, the sporting pastimes, which all fed into politics um, in Ireland at the time. Having said that, it's probably important to stress that this wasn't a, a, an exceptional case. I'll give you another example of what happened was happening in England in the early 1890s. Uh, the journalist Robert Blatchford, who was um, at the Manchester Evening Chronicle, he, Blatchford and a number of his associates resigned from the, the um, Manchester Evening Chronicle because of the owner's uh, reluctance to publish anything which advocated socialism. And upon leaving this uh, publication, they launched a new publication, a newspaper called The Clarion, which had an impromptu distribu distribution network of cyclists that eventually evolved into the Clarion Cycling Clubs. And the Clarion Cycling Club stood for politics, what we would call now bottom-up politics. 
<clears throat> so what you had was men and women traveling around uh, Britain and um, distributing the, the, the newspaper, but also preaching the principles of socialist society and the club's motto, which was quite a long motto, but it took in uh, something that says cyclists for mutual aid, good fellowship and the propagation of socialist uh, principles. But what was combined with this, and this is what I've alluded to earlier, was the sense of social pleasure that cycling brought. And it was this sense of so, uh, you know, um, social pleasure combined with a political message that was quite, um, it was quite enticing to a lot of people. And that's what you find in Ireland at the time and in later times and right up to the present day. So as I said, there was a, a cultural revival happening in, in Ireland in the 1890s that went across the language, literature, politics, or sorry, language, literature, sport, and eventually fed into politics. A good example of that is the Gaelic Athletic Association, which was formed in 1884. And uh, besides the, the more recognizable uh, sporting endeavors of that and football and hurling, they sought to incorporate athletics and cycling into this vision for an Irish Ireland. But earlier that year in 1884, the Irish Cycling Association had also been, in, uh, been formed. And therefore you had two organizations, two burgeoning organizations in the middle of this growing cyclist craze, um, vying for uh, recruits. So they were, they were rivals. But the GAA had this uh, competitive edge in that they were tapping into the prevailing political um, climate of the time and nationalist politics, what they, they could offer that the Irish Cycling Association couldn't offer. So by 1910, the Irish Cycling Association had folded leaving the nationalist-minded GAA as the main governing body for cycling, as well as the other more famous uh, sporting codes under its jurisdiction. The Irish language, of course, is what drew me to this, and this was an integral part of this cultural revolution in, in the 1890s. But prior to that, it had been the preserve of, you know, sort of well-to-do people, really well-meaning people, antiquarians, which meant that there was a popular perception that it was, you know, nothing more than a, a hobby. It was pretty backward looking. And that's what the critics of the Irish language revival basically were, their argument was that they were irrelevant and backward looking in what was an increasingly modernizing Ireland at the time. But this is, has been disputed in recent times by the, uh, the literature um, academics and uh, historians, Declan Kybert and, P.J. Matthews, who dismissed this, stating that the people involved in the, the Cultural Revolution of the 1890s were critical traditionalists who were keen to modernize in a non-imperial way, with uh, the Irish language being a vehicle for this non-imperial modernization. And this is certainly true of the language rights activists uh, that this article is concerned with, and who I interviewed um, a number of years ago in relation to, the, to this research. Uh, they, these people considered themselves forward-facing cultural revivalists uh, who stressed the link between language revival, cultural self-belief, and a more vibrant community. And that holds today as it did, for, as it did in the 1890s. Uh, and this viewpoint is certainly reminiscent of the bottom-up bottom up, uh, approach to cultural and political change as advocated by the likes of the Clarion Cycling Clubs in Britain. Indeed, the ideals of the Irish revival movement as forward-looking on imperial agents of change was to be found right through. Um, and I'll explain more about that uh, shortly. At the turn of the century, there was a number of cycling clubs that were attached to language uh, preservation and revival and, and politics. And crucially, Belfast was really well known for this. Uh, a, a number of articles I've looked at uh, Contemporary articles uh, and newspaper reports from the turn of the century uh, state that Belfast was very well known for its vibrant language uh, revival community, but also its um, cycling community, and these things were combined. Uh, but it was crucially, it was the history attached to Belfast and the history of its scenery, which all melded together to give this really appealing um, pastime of uh, Gaelic cycling clubs. Sorry. <clears throat> and 
you find a lot of these groups really took off from the turn of the century right up till 1913, 1914 time, when you're at the height of the Home Rule crisis, and then, of course, the First World War. But it is, it, it should be said that this wasn't just mainly the pursuit of people who would have been Irish nationalists. When you get into the Home Rule crisis period and leading up to World War I, say 1913 time, you've got a lot of people who are attached to the, the recently formed Ulster Volunteer Force who form cycling corps and um, are very much part of the uh, resistance to Home Rule. There's, there's some um, really interesting photographs that I really want to look at in more detail about um, you know, the, the UVF and, and mass gatherings. Um, there was the um, Barnes Court um, gathering in County Tyrone, and what you see there are hundreds upon hundreds of cyclists who are part of the Ulster Volunteer Force, and that's something I would like to develop in, in the future. But in this period, when you're looking at uh, when it comes into what can be termed violent uh, revolution with the Easter Rising, what you see is the, the, the bicycle plays a very important role in this insurrection and the later War of Independence. Uh, the Bureau of Military History in Dublin is a very, very interesting resource. And if anyone listening to this wants to look at it, it's all online. This features a number of statements of people who took part in what was termed the revolutionary period in Ireland. And what you see in this is the importance of the bicycle for people who are going around, cycling around the country, um, drilling uh, uh, volunteer troops, but also shows you their attachment to Irish language groups and things like that. The most prominent um, person you can think of uh, would probably be Sean McDermott, who was one of the signatories of the uh, the, the Easter Rising, the, the proclamation of independence. Now, of course, he was executed, so he didn't um, make a witness statement. But nevertheless, he's a good example of somebody who worked tirelessly using the bicycle to um, propagate this uh, this revolution that was taking was going to take place. There's a number of interesting um, entries into that witness statement where you see people like cycling from there was a, a new person, a person from Newry, Patrick Rankin, who cycled from Newry to Dublin to join in the Easter Rising. And then you've got people like uh, Peter Galligan, who cycled from Dublin to Enniscorthy, County Carlow, to give orders to volunteers there to cut the railway lines to prevent uh, reinforcements of British troops getting into Dublin. So you can see it's a very important um, tool in that sort of situation. But by the time of autumn 1916, before the release of people who had taken place, taken part in the Easter Rising, Dublin Metropolitan Police and the RAC note in their notes a revival of this type of activity, and then note the growth, the growth of organisations such as the GAA, but they also note the growth of the formation of cycling clubs who were holding social events and advocating for the Irish language. And they argued that this was an indicator of a transformation in our society. Bearing in mind, this was before the, uh, the, the uh, War of Independence and before people had been released from the, the, the Irish, um, who'd taken part in Easter Rising, apologies. Of the, the numerous witness statements the Bureau of Military History has, one entry by Sean Prendergast demonstrates the symbolic power of the bicycle in the public sphere during the revolutionary period. And he's speaking about the death of the, um, another volunteer called Joseph Norton in 1917, who himself had taken part in the Easter Rising the year before. And Prendergast notes that the, the cortege that um, attended his funeral had thousands of people, but also uh, there was he noticed a uh, cyclist who numbered a thousand, and he said they had caused a sensation in their formation as they marched through the city centre of Dublin and were dismissed out of Collins Street. So you can see how the bicycle was very much an eye-catching um, protest in this in this respect. It's very symbolic. But during the last months of the the War of Independence conflict, if we can move on to that. Before the truce of 1929 or 21, sorry, British intelligence they ordered the raiding parties who were going after the volunteers to seize all bicycles 
and this was around May 1921, right before the truce, because the, the, the British intelligence had realized the importance of bicycles to insurrectional activity. And this has been termed the bicycle war by historian Joseph McKenna. So we can see in this period that the bicycle was now recognized as a tool of protest, as a vehicle of, of identity within the cultural movement and a crucial tool in the Irish Revolution. When we go on to the post-partition era, the political settlement of 1920 and then 1921, the Government of Ireland Act, etc. The, the Anglo-Irish um, Agreement a, a year later, which set up the, the 26 county state. Within that, the language movement went into a sort of uh, stagnation because many within the Gaelic League felt that there was enough people on both sides of the treaty split to ensure a, a very vibrant and forward-looking language policy. But on the other hand, you know, um, in relation to the North, people were in a different um, situation and it, it really stayed a bottom-up sort of um, movement in relation to the language. Uh, in the South, they had a number of people who were very, they were detractors of the, 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 the Irish Free State Government and they argued that the Irish government viewed the language, uh, the Irish language, with a great deal of false sen sentimentality. And that's what they did uh, to a certain extent. And it, a number of pressure groups uh, emerged in the wake of this, particularly when you get to the point of the, um, the 1930s and the worldwide depression. So there were a number of factors, economic factors, social factors, all combined along wrapped up with uh, linguistic rights. Um, one of the, the main pressure groups that were formed in that period was an organization called Munchen Agiltakta, and that was headed by Martin O'Kan, the writer, and revolutionary Martin O'Kan. And that's very interesting. They argued that land reform and agricultural development was key to the survival of Gieltacht areas. Uh, and this organization was heavily influenced by socialism at the time and was very radical, leading to the being heavily monitored by the Irish Free State. The defining moment for this organization came in Easter of 1934, when they engaged in this very symbolic act of protest using bicycles. Members of Munchen and Giltakta set out from Ross Muck in Connemara and traveled to Dublin on the 29th of March, 1934, Good Friday. Uh, they were monitored by police uh, and really, there was a, a sense of unease among uh, politicians and um, the police as to what this uh, organization were capable of doing. But they went and they met, with, they traveled to Dublin with the intention of confronting the Minister for Lands and Agriculture, Andy Eamon de Valera, about the failure to enact policies which would see, you know, the, the um, regeneration of Giltacht areas. Uh, the outcome of this was the establishment of the Rathcairn Gaeltacht in Meath, uh, which was established in 1934-1935 time. And this is very important to the later story of Belfast and how this uh, all, all comes together. The, um, <clears throat> pardon me. It's a, this, uh, as I said, this, this act of traveling from uh, Connemara to Dublin to confront Ian and Davalera resulted in the establishment of the Rathcair and Uh In the north, however, at this time, Irish language speakers were arguably in a worse position than those in the Free State. While the Free State uh, government paid lip service to the language, there was hostility to the language uh, with the Stormont government. And this lack of significant political backing forced a grassroots approach to language preservation in the North that often uh, went hand in hand with protest. And if you look at uh, newspaper reports from the period, they provide a really interesting insight into language preservation groups which were operating within uh, the Northern Ireland. Uh, newspapers like the Ulster Herald uh, were very, very, um, prominent in promoting these organizations. They argued that um, the powers of be in the North did everything they could to 
curtail the use of the language uh, to kill it off, but that these groups attached to cycling groups in the North were fighting against that. They were very prominent at showing that the language lived in, in the North. And the Straban Chronicle was another one which showed different groups in different, uh, different counties that were all interconnected as far away as Armagh and Derry, that there were all these cycling group, uh, groups that were interconnected, that you were using cycling to travel to each other, to speak the language, to build up a sense of community. And in Belfast, we see similar communal identity which gelled around the everyday use of the Irish language. There's been work by Gabrielle Maguire back in the early 90s that showed that there was a vibrant but um, frustrated Irish-speaking community in Belfast just in the post-war period, which had a number of initiatives, um, including publications to, that try to gel this sense of community. But what Maguire shows that there was groups, uh, there were initiatives like Irish language credit societies and Irish language cycling groups that were integral to this community. And this community was, uh, interestingly, significantly influenced by Martin O'Kan and his radical bottom-up uh, approach to cultural and political philosophies. Drawn upon that rich and long cultural heritage in Belfast and other parts of the island, the Belfast-based Irish language cycling organisation Common Riata Loch Lee have in recent years paid tribute to Martin O'Kane and that 1934 protest um, by Munchen and Gilpakta. And they did this to draw attention to Irish language rights in Northern Ireland in the present day. And the group, like the groups that went before, they aim to produce, uh, promote the social use of the Irish language among learners and fluent speakers through cycling activities. And as I say, this is much the same vein as organizations that went right back to the 1890s. So in 2014, uh, the group chose to pay tribute to the 1934 Munchen Gaeltacht protest by cycling from the Coulterland in West Belfast to the Rathcairn Gaeltacht in Meath. And as people will be aware, we're right in towards the end now of what has been termed the decade of centenaries. And all of this attention has been on these 100th anniversaries. But anniversaries like this really slipped under the wayside, and that's why I wanted to highlight them. And I've called this uh, an act of practical commemoration rather than cer ceremonial commemoration, because it paid tribute to O'Kane and Munchen and Gilthacker's efforts on the 80th anniversary of their event. And it was to raise funds for Irish speakers in Belfast who were embroiled in a court case with the Northern Department of Education over its refusal to grant Irish medium pupils free travel passes to Belfast Collage de Fersia. Uh, and in the wake of this commemoration, I interviewed a number of these uh, this group's members on their motives and what they saw as their connection to the past revivalist groups and protest movements right across our, Ireland. And one of the groups uh, founding members, the, um, the author, Fergal McEnrachty, he stated that the seeds of the current language revival movement in and around Belfast were sown by the Shaw's, Rose, Shaw's Road Gilthock in Belfast, who were directly inspired by Martin O'Kane after he visited Belfast in the 1960s. And like O'Kane's organization, the modern uh, language revivalists were stressed that they weren't owned by any political party. And this is a significant point if we're considered as a grassroots movement and in keeping with previous bottom-up protest movements that operated outside uh, state agencies. And while the primary motive for the 2014 protest was to raise funds for Irish language speaking children to get them a bus to go to their, their school, if, if Fergal states that the protest was not only a way to commemorate the 1934 cycle, but a commemorative cycle in 1954, which took place on the 20th anniversary of the 1934 event, and went from Ross, uh, Ross Muck in Connemara to the Rathcairn Gaeltacht in, in Meath. And this is, uh, uh, Martin O'Kan spoke at that as well. He also said it was to highlight that there was a direct lineage from all the groups, such as Munchen Atir, or Munchen Gaeltacht, um, apologies, uh, right back to the founding, uh, the foundation of the cultural revival movement in the 1890s. 
significantly this 2014 Act, which, as I've highlighted, it paid tribute to Martin O'Kane and Munchen O'Gale Tapta, it evolved into what was recognised as one of the biggest protest movements for the Irish language rights in the history of the island of Ireland. The, the group and Dream, and Dream Jarred uh, was formed to voice their frustrations at the treatment of the Irish language um, community and the denial of rights to Irish speakers uh, by the, the previous uh, Stormont, um, Stormont government. And of course that led to the collapse of the Stormont government over the RHI, but also uh, over the treatment of Irish language speakers. Now back up and running uh, over the last couple of months, it was it was very interesting to see how how that played into the previous um, Stormont regime. Uh, so it was a very important uh, connection between that and the past. And uh, Fergal and another uh, number of the people I interviewed highlighted that and highlighted that they weren't a uh, um, as what was popularly um, the, the the idea which was properly promoted that they were attached to. To say Sinn Féin in the, in the, the Storm, uh, Stormont government, but they were the, acting on their own, uh, out, off their own bat. And that is something that they were very proud of and very proud to show that they had a direct lineage to people who went before. So in conclusion, uh, over the period of 100 years or more since the creation, the recreational pursuit of cycling became popular, it's attracted those who have agitated for culture and political change. And this is Take a, take a variety of causes from road safety, as I mentioned at the beginning, women's suffrage and political revolution. But also today, what you find is that people attached to the Extinction Rebellion movement. And uh, another example is the Palest in Palestine, the Ramallah Riders uh, were formed in uh, a number of years ago, perhaps 2015, 2016, all using the bicycle to show or to highlight their causes and what, what they want to happen. But in Ireland, which I find very interesting, uh, it was perhaps fortuitous that this cycling revolution came at the time when there was a cultural revolution. And ever since then, the two have been inextricably linked. Uh, and they were activists for change in the all important decades in Ireland, which we're now commemorating as the Irish revolutionary period. But also in the post-partition uh, era, uh, you can see that, as I say, from the Bureau of Military History, from um, contemporary newspaper reports that build up this, um, you know, th this picture of a very vibrant uh, people who, who are agitating for change. And this was hugely important, as it has been inferably used by those who were disenfranchised by the status quo, and this permits the researcher to look at them as important markers of what is termed history from below. And I hope that from that vantage point, we can see issues which connected many organizations and groupings over the over a long period, not necessarily always connected to the Irish language uh, movement, but always connected to communities and communities agitating for change on the island of Ireland and beyond. So thank you very much for uh, permitting me to talk about this aspect of the research that I've undertaken. And thank you to Pete and all at Imagine Belfast. Thank you.